Now turn to section one. You will hear some people talking about getting exercise. First, you have some time to look at questions one and two. Listen carefully to the first part of the conversation and answer questions one and two. Hey, Janos, have you seen this notice here? What's that? Join our mall walking programme, Get Fit, for free. Now, I like the sound of that. I can't afford to keep up my gym membership this term. It's too expensive. Mm, I know what you mean. But what exactly is mall walking? Sounds a bit boring to me. Hold on. OK, it may sound boring, but it might be a great opportunity to take exercise. Mm. Think about it. A climate-controlled environment where you can take exercise without having to worry about the wind or the rain. Wind and rain? <laughs> Have you actually looked at the weather outside? It's snow and ice out there. I only came into the mall to keep warm. Well, it is winter and we are in Canada after all. Mm. So just think, by mall walking we can exercise indoors instead of outdoors. Great. And another thing. We won't have to worry about the traffic. Just think, no busy roads to cross and no rush hours to think about. Come on, it's worth a try. Mm, you're still not exactly selling it to me. Imagine walking past the same stores and they're not even open. So what's the point of that? Oh, come on, Janos. Just think about it as an opportunity to window shop and keep an eye out for bargains. Mm. And what about all the amazing decorations and displays we can take a look at? I think it sounds like fun. <laughs> Did you say fun? <laughs> Walking on a hard surface like concrete. Give me grass any day. Much more comfortable on the feet. And there's another thing. In a mall, you're always close to restrooms. And water come to that. What could be better than that? I think I know the answer to that one. Exercising in a gym is a whole lot better. Well, anyway, we can get more details at the information kiosk. So, do you want to come with me or not? Uh, I'll give it a miss. I'm off to the gym to make the most of my membership before it runs out. <laughs> <laughs> now you have some time to look at questions three to seven. Now listen to the next part of the conversation and answer questions three to seven. Hello. I'd like more information about the mall walking programme. Great. We're always looking for new members. Can I just ask you how you found out about the programme? Oh, uh, on the notice board on the first floor. Oh, that's great. Most of our new members come through the website or through friends. Good to know people still read the notice board here in the mall. Yes, I guess so. Now, let me give you some details. The programme runs weekdays, Monday through Friday. And it's an early start. Wait for it. Walkers meet at 7am. 7am? That is pretty early. But come to think of it, my lectures start at 9 most mornings, so I would be able to make it back to the campus in plenty of time. Great. Actually, most members go straight on to work or college after their walk, so you're not alone. Now, our members meet here on the ground floor. Here at the information kiosk? No, just over there at the food court. Oh, the food court. OK. Yes, just follow the smell of coffee. Normally about 10 to 15 people show up for each walk, but numbers can vary. So, up to 15 in a group. That's an ideal number. Glad it's not 50. <laughs> and how long do the walks last? You can expect to walk for one hour, but some groups do less, half an hour or so, and a few groups even do up to an hour and a half, so it's best to check when you arrive. Which day were you thinking of starting? Now you have some time to look at questions 8 to 10. Now listen to the rest of the conversation 
and answer questions 8 to 10. Well, next Monday would work for me. Morning lectures have been cancelled, so I would have plenty of time. Monday the 4th of February? Yes, that's right. OK. So, let's get your details. Can you give me your full name? Anya Karchevskaya. Can you spell your surname, please? Yes. K-A-R-C-H-E-V-S-K-A-Y-A. -E and your address? Apartment 12, 2 Burlington Street. And a contact telephone number? 0757 634 5003. I'll just read that back. 0757 634 5003. Yes. Oh, by the way, new members receive a free gift when they join, and it's a much better gift than last year. We gave people badges, but they tended to lose them. And more recently, we provided visors instead, but they weren't very popular. So this year, we're giving new members T-shirts. That's great. What colour? Yellow. I've got plenty in stock, so you can collect yours on Monday. Thanks a lot. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section two. You will hear a man talking about a parliament building. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 17. Listen carefully to the first part of the talk and answer questions 11 to 17. Good morning, everyone. Can you all see and hear me? Good. Now, my name's Dan, and I'm your guide this morning for our tour of the New Zealand Parliament. Now, we're standing in the executive wing of the Parliament complex. This is where all the government ministers have their offices and where the Prime Minister and the Cabinet meet. Now, most people here refer to this building as the Beehive, and no prizes for guessing why it's called the Beehive. That's right. It's shaped exactly like a traditional beehive, and it's one of the most famous buildings in Wellington. Now, I'll start with some background information about the design and construction of the building. It may come as a surprise for you to learn that the architect wasn't a New Zealander. No. In fact, it was designed by a Scottish architect, Sir Basil Spence. He designed the concept for the building during a visit he made to our city in 1964. His idea was that all the offices and rooms would radiate from a central core. Now, the beehive was built in stages over 10 years. Construction began on building the underground car park and the basement at the end of the 1960s, in 1969. And over the next decade, the remaining floors were constructed. Yes, one decade later, in 1979, the first parliamentary offices moved in. Now, as you can see, the beehive is pretty high. In fact, it's 72 metres tall. It has 10 floors above ground and an additional four floors below. So that's a total of 14 floors altogether. That means there's plenty of space for the many facilities available to the members of parliament and ministers to use. These include a small theatre and a television studio. Now, if you'd all just like to follow me, we can make our way inside the building itself. Now you have some time to look at questions 18 to 20. Now listen to the rest of the talk 
and answer questions 18 to 20. Here we are in the entrance foyer. It's a very airy space, isn't it? And if you look at the floor you're standing on, you'll see it's made of marble. And if you look to your left, you can see some beautiful columns. They are also made from marble. Now, look at the wall panels. They are made of stainless steel. They look really stunning, don't they? Now, straight ahead of us is the staircase leading to the first floor of the building. As you can see, the railings on the staircase are made of bronze. Now, let's make our way up this beautiful staircase to the banquet hall on the first floor. And we can admire these beautiful bronze railings on the way. So this is the banquet hall. And as you can see, it's shaped in the form of a semicircle. It's also a pretty big space, isn't it? It's actually a big enough dining room to hold up to 300 guests. Now look at the large mural to your right. It's three-dimensional and shows the atmosphere and sky of New Zealand. And the floor we're standing on is made of wood. It's a native New Zealand timber called tawa. OK, now let's make our way to the... That is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section three. You will hear two students talking about reading. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. Listen carefully to the first part of the conversation and answer questions 21 to 24. Hi, Milena. How's your research for your assignment going? Which assignment, Josh? The one on sustainable transport. It's due in on Friday. Oh, I've not nearly finished it. I've still got so many articles to get through. In fact, I need to read another two books on the reading list before I can even think about writing it up. It doesn't help that I'm a really slow reader. Well, why don't you practice speed reading, just like me? Oh, let me into your secret. If anything, if I don't get a move on, my assignment is going to be late. What exactly is speed reading, anyway? Well, speed reading basically means reading faster and more efficiently. It can make such a difference. I've noticed the benefits already, and I've only been doing it a few weeks. Sounds good. What benefits are we talking exactly? Well, the majority of people read at an average rate of 250 words a minute. So that means that an average page in a book or document would take you around one or two minutes to read. So up to two minutes a page? That sounds quite fast to me. I reckon I spend at least five minutes on each one. But just think about it. Imagine if you could double that rate to 500 words a minute. You could zip through all the articles and books in half the time. Another thing is that it can help you understand the basic structure of an idea or an argument much better. Now you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30.
Now listen to the next part of the conversation and answer questions 25 to 30. You make speed reading sound like some kind of sport. Well, actually, speed reading is a bit like playing sport. I like to think it's similar to running. Running? Much too fast for me. I'm more of a jogger. You're not selling it to me very well. OK, OK, but just think about what it takes to be a fast runner. You can learn the techniques, but to get really good at it and build up your speed, you really need to practice. But athletes train for hours every day. That's true, but your reading speed can improve if you practice a few basic techniques. The first thing to do is to actually find out how fast you're reading at the moment. So, time my current reading speed. But I read so slowly, it will be really depressing to find out just how slow I am. Believe me, timing yourself is a really good idea and it's so easy to do. There are lots of online speed reading tests. You just enter the words reading speed test into Google and loads will come up. You could also do a reading comprehension test and see how well you understand what you're reading. I don't know. But remember to read at your normal speed and time yourself on a few different pages. The average of your times should indicate your average reading speed. What do I do next? Well, the next thing to do, and this is really important, is to get rid of distractions. I used to think that music in the background while I was reading was a good thing, but it wasn't for me. I found I increased my speed by working without any noise whatsoever. I usually read in the library, but there always seem to be people talking around me. Well, try using earplugs to block out all the distractions. Another important thing is to set yourself targets. Basically, if you know what your goal is, you're more likely to achieve it. My goal? Well, that's easy. I need to find out about the problems of accessible transport in Africa and then think about some solutions. I know what I need to do, but I keep skipping back to a sentence I've just read. And at other times, I go back a few pages just to make sure that I've read something right. I know what you mean. Actually, a lot of people do that when they read. They reread material when they don't actually need to. It's called regression, and it's important to get out of the habit of doing it. You can reduce the number of times your eyes skip back by running your finger or a pencil along each line you read. Your eyes will follow the tip of your finger, and this helps you avoid skipping back. Why not give it a try? Yes, I think I'll give it a go. But I suppose the first thing to do is find out what my reading speed is. What a thought! That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section four. You will hear a man talking about tourism and the environment. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Listen carefully to the talk and answer questions 31 to 40. Good morning, everyone. Let's make a start. Now, over the last few weeks, we've looked at some key areas in the travel and tourism module. We've already charted the origins and development of tourism, and we've also looked at the negative effects of tourism on both local communities and the environment. So, in this lecture, we're going to focus on ways in which tourists can actually benefit local people and natural areas if they travel responsibly. And this kind of travel 
is known as ecotourism. Now, there's no one definition of ecotourism. In fact, it can be interpreted in a number of different ways. This means it represents different things to different people. And sometimes people misunderstand ecotourism altogether. They think of it as just spending time in nature or natural areas. However, the truth is far more complex. In essence, it aims to minimize the negative impacts of tourism that we looked at earlier on in the course. Problems such as litter and water pollution, crime and so on, and, at the same time, to encourage travellers to have a positive impact on the places they visit. Now, there are many other words to describe a similar idea to ecotourism. In fact, the terms alternative tourism, sustainable tourism, or responsible tourism are often used to mean the same thing. But in fact, although the main ideas behind them are similar, there are small differences. And let's briefly look at these now. Alternative tourism is any kind of tourism that is not mass tourism. And by mass tourism, we mean hundreds, if not thousands, of people going on, for example, their two weeks a year beach holidays or traditional sightseeing tours. Alternative tourism includes travel such as backpacking and adventure holidays. And the term alternative also includes ecotourism, which is what we are mainly focusing on today. Now, what about sustainable tourism? Sustainable tourism has the same ideals as ecotourism, but it isn't limited to natural areas. So, you can have a sustainable tourist experience in a city or a town. And then we have responsible tourism. What does that mean exactly? Now, basically, this involves acting responsibly and respectfully as a guest when we travel overseas. And what do we mean by respectful? Well, being respectful might involve asking permission to take photographs or go into someone's home observing some of the customs of the local community, such as dress or making an effort to learn the language. Now, ecotourism can be passive or active. So, what do we mean by passive tourism? Well, let's think of some specific examples. A passive tourist might buy their holiday package from a company that donate part of their profits to local charities. Or a passive tourist might book environmentally friendly accommodation. This means choosing to stay in a hotel which may use solar power as a source of energy or changes sheets and towels for their guests less frequently. Now, active ecotourisms a way for people to enjoy everything that nature has to offer and at the same time enable them to leave a positive mark on the environment. Now, this kind of ecotourist is sometimes referred to as a voluntourist. That's a combination of volunteer and tourist. You get the idea. Now, voluntourists prefer to experience a new place in an active way. And this doesn't mean sitting in a tourist bus or listening to a pre-recorded guide. Basically, they want to physically connect with the place they're visiting. And this includes connecting with humans and animals. Now, their approach to travel can make a real difference and can really benefit the places and the communities they choose to visit. Voluntourists often help local people construct and repair buildings, or it could mean being willing to help a community with nature conservation.
So let's think of some specific examples of this kind of work in action. Now, voluntourists have helped local communities to plant hundreds of trees and installed identifying signs in the rainforests of Costa Rica. They've also helped with sustainable food production in Cuba, and in Jamaica, they've been involved in the cleaning up of local rivers. And in Thailand, they've worked on building ecologically sustainable reforested habitats. Now, some of the work that voluntourists do also involves looking after endangered animals, like the Giant Panda Project in Japan, or the Animal Sanctuary Project in Ecuador. Now, this work doesn't just involve interacting with wildlife, but involves educating local people about the need to protect wildlife. Now, before we explore wildlife tourism in more detail, does anyone have any questions? That is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. You now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet. That is the end of test 6.